Michigan at that time. The Baptist Church got more prayer. And I remember a Wednesday night, I raised my hand and I said, everybody pray for me because I'm about to go get paid to play the sport I love to play. You know what they prayed for that evening? They prayed that the Lord would keep me there and save my soul. And that night, I bowed before a pew as the other men, we went back to the back pews, and all the other men, the pastors, the deacons, the elders, they prayed, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, protect my family because I can't do it anymore. I'm about to go play football. You know, they all got up, and I stayed. And I said, God, if this book is your inspired word, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And if this book right here is the inspired word of the God that you may, some of you may profess to believe, if this is the inspired word of God, this word of God says that all have sinned and come short of his glory. That none are righteous, no, not one, that none seeketh after him. None. And I said, God, if this be your inspired word, then I am a sinner. And if I am a sinner, I am rightly condemned to hell. And I said, Lord, if this be your word, then your son must be real. The word of God, you all know it. It says, for God so loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in that moment I cried out for God's mercy. And I said, Lord, save my soul. I am a wretched man. I am vile. I am defiled. I am vile before you. Save me, O Lord. And in that moment, a peace that passeth all understanding. That peace that passeth. All understanding, the peace that this world cannot give to you. God gave me. He lived in every sin, every shame, every guilt, everything I'd ever committed. He said, my son, thou sins be forgiven thee. I got up. And two months later, I surrendered my life to the ministry. Two years later, two years ago, this past March, was whenever I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Two years later, the Lord has put me in third world countries to preach the gospel. He has put me before men and women to preach the gospel. He has put me before congregations to preach the gospel. Listen to me. God does not call many wise or many mighty or many noble, but he calls the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He uses the foolishness of preaching. Do you think in all honesty, I stand up here because I want to seem like a fool before you. I stand up here because I love you, but my love in comparison to a holy God's love for his creation, not you. It pales in comparison. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die in your place, the death that you rightly deserve because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not a physical death because it's inevitable. Every single one of us sitting here, every single one of us in earshot will die. It's inevitable, 100%. That's not the death you're speaking of. The death you're speaking of is a separation, a spiritual death. The death eternally separated from the Holy God, no longer to cry out for his mercy in a place called hell, called the lake of fire. He says all you have to do he says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. See, many of you may have a hand profession of God because literally his creation cries out. Tell me why my molecules are the same as your molecules and my molecules are put together so much differently than they go through. Tell me, did that come from a pipe play more of you? They just decided on motions to take place. Then nothing from nothing created something. Tell me this. Don't create that tree for me. God is real. God is living. This book is living. This is the inspired word of God. And if this might be the inspired word of God, this word says that all, all have sinned and come short of his glory. And it says, if thou shalt repent, believe the gospel. The very 
everything that I said to you, that Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, took your punishment on the cross, shed his perfect, precious blood, and then rose from the grave three days later, and he says, all you have to do is believe. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift from God. Not of works that any man should boast, but I'm being warned you here this evening. If you think that you should be God, and you have not become a new creature in that moment of your regeneration, of supposed regeneration, Jesus said, on that day, many are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, they're going to call you Lord. He's going to declare unto them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity.
And immediately, he lifted up his eyes and hell, being in torment. Will that be your eternal destiny? For it's not just a physical death. Scripture says in Revelation 14, that all those that take the mark of the beast in their hand or in their forehead, they will be cast into the lake of fire and the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever and ever. It says about that same lake of fire, Revelation 20, that all those that are not found written in the book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire. In Revelation 21, Oh, please listen to this, friends. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving, the adulterers and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and even all liars shall have their course in the lake which burneth with fire brimstone, which is the second death. Does that concern you? Men and women of Indianapolis, does it concern you that you sin against God? And you know you've not received the forgiveness of God. You've not been given eternal life. That you will face an eternity in hell that should concern you, dear friends. And many try, when they hear this sentence upon themselves, to make themselves right and justify themselves before God. But it'll never work. As James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Whoso keepeth the whole law, yet offended in one point, he is guilty of all. The book of Isaiah says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You ask yourself, friend, if you're guilty of a crime in Indianapolis, you go before a judge. You say, judge, I washed your car before I got here. I helped an old lady across the street. I gave some money to the poor. What do you think the judge would say? He may say, what are you trying to bribe me? We have a saying, we say, you do the crime, you do the time. You have a promise from the word of God. You sin against God, you will die. You will face a physical and a spiritual death. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of work, but to the man should boast. For a few moments of your life tonight, there's been a God lovingly calling you to repentance. But there's no ice cream in hell. There's no water in hell. I want you to consider that the path that you're on, that you're going headlong in rebellion against God, on a dark path. You know not at what you stumble. But God sends his men to you to preach the word of God. And yes, it's like a lightning bolt. It may be frightening. It may interrupt your peaceful evening. But it's what you need to turn you from your 
said. Let me ask you, Fred, if you were in darkness, do not where you were going. The lightning bolt struck, and it lighted your path. When it lighted your path, you realized that you were headed for a cliff. What would you do? You were headed for a great chasm and cliff. Whereas if you were to fall, you would die, certainly. You know, friends, there's only be one logical response. Turn. When the light shines on your pathway. Turn from the damnation to come. Flee from the wrath to come. That may be very bad news, but it doesn't stop there. Praise be to God. Who all we deserve is hell. Who all we deserve is judgment. God showed mercy upon us his son into this world. He preached the gospel. What does that mean? It means the good news. That's what the gospel literally means. Good news. There is good news. According to 1 Corinthians 15, it says, the gospel rests the only thing that can save you. The gospel is that Christ died for your sins according to scripture that he was buried and three days later he rose again from the dead according to scripture that is the good news which you must obey and you must accept and the way that you accept that is repentance and faith God's offer of salvation to you tonight is very simple. You repent, you believe, you shall be saved. You will be given eternal life. But what does it mean to repent? In Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 it says, To seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Call ye upon him while he is let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, for he will have mercy upon him, and unto our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You won't be deceived like God was, friends, thinking that you could go on in your sin and receive pardon and mercy from God. No, unless you turn from your wicked way, unless you turn from your unrighteous thoughts, there will be no mercy, there will be no pardon. 2 Corinthians 7 says that godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Not to be repented of. I'll tell you, if you've never had sorrow for your sin, you're not ready to repent. You're not ready to be saved. But God is seeking tonight your best friend, one who holds your breath in his hands. Seeking to show you that though you've spit in his face with your sins, He's still been more of a friend to you than you've ever known. It is He that is giving you your intellect. It is He who is giving you your strength. It is He that is giving you even the power to make wealth. How foolish and prideful is it for us to actually take credit upon ourselves for everything that God has given us? We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He will 
will lift us up in due time. To believe the gospel simply needs to trust. To trust the living God. Your soul's salvation. Trust Him to save you from your sin. Trust Him to save you from damnation. He has already proven abundantly His work. That He died for your sins. He's done His part, friend. Have you done yours? Have you done what you're supposed to do? Have you given Christ what He, what is owed to Him? The Lamb that was slain deserves the reward of His suffering. Have you given it to Him? If you've not, will you do so right now? Repent, believe. The moment you do so, God will take you spiritually. To put you on the cross with the Lord Jesus. Crucify your man of sin there. Put you in the grave with the Lord Jesus. And then raise you to walk in newness of life. And he'll fill you with his spirit full of love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith. And he promises you, promises you these things. Temptation, tribulation, persecution, and lastly, eternal life. Far more worth anything you could ever find on this earth. That's why it compares it. It says, The man who found treasure in a field, he went and sold everything he had, and he bought that field. The kingdom of heaven. It's like a man who found a pearl of great price. He went and he sold everything he had, and he bought that pearl. I pray you see the infinite worth of the life of the Son of God. Bow your heart to Him today and worship Him and in spirit and in truth. If you listen to me tonight, I thank you, I pray that God blesses you as you do His will.